of hearing instruments and also assistive listening devices, one of which is FM systems. So I'm very familiar with FM and very familiar with hearing aids and now very familiar with cochlear implants. And then prior to that, I worked um, in an ENT practice with pediatrics for almost 12 years. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Don. Um, one of the questions that was asked before you got on the line was that if anyone had any questions, if they should wait to the end or if they could ask in between or... Oh, whenever, sure. Ask whenever. And my understanding was we were kind of doing this as an open question and answer format anyway. After coming up to prepare the thing, so I, I have my PowerPoints all ready to go, but... So any questions that anybody has, I would say just ask them at any time. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you. So I guess um, let's start from the very beginning because there are folks on the call that have children under a year old. So okay. Can you share a little bit about the benefits of an FM system and um, maybe what age range you think they're appropriate for? Sure. Um, so basically, I'm going to assume most people have a kind of basic understanding of what FM is. Um, the technologies that we have now for cochlear implants or hearing aids are fantastic. And compared to what they were when I started 20 years ago, the improvements are phenomenal. You know, hearing aids now we're talking about, you know, automatic switching programs and directional microphones and lots of noise canceling to try and give the first one, the best, clearest signal that we can. 20 years ago with cochlear implants, we were talking about pretty much whether you could hear a bang on the table or not. Um, and now we're talking about kids talking on the phone and being able to hear music. So they've definitely come a long way. The um, disadvantage to either a hearing aid or cochlear implant is they give the best hearing and the best access to sound in a short range, which is about six feet. And once you get outside of that hearing bubble of about six feet, the external world starts to interfere with the sounds that we're trying to pick up and we're trying to hear. Um, so, you know, somebody sneezing over there, somebody talking over there, a car goes by over there. All of those sounds interfere with the speech signal that we want the children to hear. Especially when you get outside of six feet, sounds or your voice starts to lose a lot of power and you're looking at about 6 dB for every 6 foot out. So it really starts to deteriorate over distance. When you add an FM system to an existing implant or hearing aid, basically what you're doing then is you're putting an external receiver onto the implant or the hearing aid, and you're giving the person who's talking a transmitter. The person talks into the transmitter, and then that signal gets piggybacked onto the back of a wireless signal. And, um, all right, whoever's doing the dishes there <laughs> um, and <clears throat> gets put on the back of a wireless signal, and it's usually an FM signal, and it then gets transmitted over space. The advantage to that is the speech signal is then embedded into that wireless signal, so will not be interfered with by external sound or uh, noises or echoes that are created from in the room, and it gives the child a nice clean signal at the ear level, pretty much like you're talking right into their ear, like you're standing right next to them and you're talking right into their ear. So that's kind of like a basic understanding of how FM works. And, and the advantages to the child, then, is that, you know, they get this nice, clean signal at their ear, and you could be as much as 120 feet away in an open space, and they'll hear you just like you're standing next to them. The disadvantages to FM is that sometimes the signal can get interfered with by other things in the environment. Um, it is a dedicated frequency, and it's been set by the FAA, not the FAA, the um, governing body of frequency transmission in the U.S. that it's 216 to 217 megahertz, and nothing else is supposed to be on that frequency. So, for example, airplanes aren't supposed to transmit, truckers aren't supposed to transmit, police aren't supposed to transmit, nobody's supposed to transmit except for FM signals. However, 
I can attest to you that um, being close to O'Hare, as Child Choice is, every once in a while we do get a trucker that is on that frequency that shouldn't be, and all of a sudden the kids are saying, I hear a guy talking. It happens very rarely, but it does happen. There's a, Carrie, there's a lot of noise going on. I don't know what that is, but I don't know if it's my phone or if somebody's banging around there, but... Um, the other thing that can interfere with the signal are um, in buildings, when you're inside a building, can be a lot of uh, metal of the building to interfere with how well the signal is transmitted. Um, also, wireless systems. Now we have a wireless computer. Sometimes can interfere with the signal and create some uh, noise within the signal as well. But for the most part, the benefits far outweigh uh, the trouble that you're going to run into. Um, as far as the age range, FM can be fit on any age child, um, even baby. Um, the only issue is with babies is parents are going to have to be very, very diligent about checking their listening devices, but then also checking uh, their FM devices to ensure that it is functioning correctly. So pretty much putting on your stethoscope, listening to the hearing aid by itself, putting the FM boot on, syncing it, because you do have to sync the receiver to the transmitter, and then making sure that that is happening. Because the babies obviously aren't going to be able to tell you that something is going wrong. Um, most babies, you know, a lot of people don't fit FM on babies because most of when babies are listening and hearing, they're very, very close to mom or dad. They're within six feet, if not being held. So the thought is, with their hearing devices already on the ears, they're probably getting a pretty good signal anyway. In the school, as far as our school goes, I mean, I really try and get the children into FM as soon as possible, but they do have to be a participant. So I'm looking for them to be able to tell me, at least I hear the beep, uh, which is the thinking beep that they hear when they think of a transmitter. And hopefully they be in, the, in that uh, self-advocacy state where they can tell us it's not working. You know, if they're, they're already telling me their hearing aid isn't working or the implant's not working. That's pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty confident that we could probably put an FM on and make it work for them. We know that when they get into the mainstream, pretty much any child with a hearing loss is going to need an FM. And no doubt about it, the size of the classrooms, the acoustics of the classrooms are going to dictate that they need an FM. So that's my little soapbox on FM. Do we have any questions already out there? Can you talk a little bit about technology of FMs as far as um, maybe some of the systems or devices that are out now and maybe how they differ? Um, sure. There are three basic types. The way FM gets broken down as far as assistive devices goes, there is um, a room FM, which means you can put a room sound field system in. What that means is there's basically one speaker or for the room. Now, some of them, you know, you'll go into, like, hotels, for example, and they have speakers in the ceiling, and then the, the person who's is wearing a transmitter. That's, that's the sound field system for a room. So basically you're giving benefit to everybody in the room. That is appropriate for normal hearing children. Um, in a, and it has been shown to have great benefits in every regular day classroom, even with normal hearing children, as far as their ability to focus, their ability to hear. Um, you know, the teacher has less space, they're not yelling as much. However, it's not the best choice for a child with hearing loss. The, the next type of FM, and, and these are pretty rare now, but you do still see some school districts having them, are tabletop FMs. So basically, it's the same thing as what I just described as far as the room system goes, but the child with hearing loss has a little speaker on their desk. Again, it's an okay benefit, but not the best choice for a child with hearing loss. And then the last type of FM is the personal FM system, which means the child has personal receivers that boot into their current hearing system, and then the speaker has a transmitter. And all studies show, and there's many, 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 many studies out there from way smarter people than I, um, show that that personal FM system gives the best benefits for children with hearing loss. And that is going to be the, the one that I choose for our children 
every time. Unless there's some other precluding reason why they can't have a person let them, that is one that is going to be the choice for me for children. So those are the things. Uh, there are two companies that are the big wigs in FM. Really, Phonex has 95% of the market right now for FM. I don't know of any school districts that I deal with that are dealing with anybody but Phonex. So for personal FM and room FMs, um, Phonex is a big cheese. Um, Oticon has a small bite of that cookie, you know, maybe 4%. Um, and then there are some other um, companies that are making the room systems that are pretty good. At the school, I have a couple of Red Cats um, for our large classrooms that we use um, for, you know, to have as an assistive device for kids that yet don't yet have FM, but then we also hook in their personal FMs to that as well. All right, I'm going to jump in with another question. Okay. What about accessories? Like, if they can they use them to listen to um, their iPods or their DSs? I mean, can you connect those things to any of the other things that they might use? Or well, there's two ways you can do it. You can directly wire the child into um, an accessory. So, like for example, the implants have accessory cables that you can buy. What, the big thing you don't want to avoid, I'm going to get this out on the table now, is you don't want to wire a child into the wall <laughs> or anything that's wired into a wall. So, for example, if you want them to use a computer, you don't, you know, the, the worst case scenario is to have the kids plugged into something that's plugged into a wall. You know, not a good thing, 210 volts, you know, coming through a device. So the way to get around that, and, and we use it a lot, is to hook the FM actually into that device. So the FM comes with um, an accessory cable that has a male jack at both ends. It's a 3.5 millimeter jack. One end will go into your headphone jack of your device, whether it's an iPod or an iPhone or a DS or a DVD player. And then the other end goes into the transmitter. And then you're just broadcasting wirelessly to the child. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about um, use of the FM with those different, you know, hooking it up or how it's used with different electronics and stuff like that? Sure. Um, like I said, but you, you need that that accessory cable that usually comes when you buy an FM. It comes as a kit, and it's usually in there. What I find, um, and I found this a lot just playing with FM and phone, is a lot of times they will say, for example, I was um, trying, trying to use it with my iPhone or my iPod. Um, you would have to make sure on the iPhone or the iPod that the volume is turned up. You know, now, that scares a lot of people because you say, oh, my gosh, I'm turning the volume up as high as it will go on the iPhone. What are they getting? But actually, you've got to remember that the child's hearing devices are the master of everything. So they're going to dictate what comes into the child, and that's set by the audiologist. So you can't, can't ever over, you know, stimulate them with sound from an iPod because the end product is the implants or the hearing aid that's the master of everything. So it works very well. Why does it have to be all the way up besides curiosity? It has to do with impedance in the wires. The impedance between the accessory cable and the actual device that you're using. Hmm. You know, everything about, you know, electronics is electricity and ohms and impedance, and sometimes there can be an impedance mismatch. So you're going to need to turn the volume up on the device that you're trying to use. And all of a sudden you turn the volume up, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> so they weren't hearing everything. You know, all of a sudden they'll tell you it's not working, it's not working, it's not working, and then you turn the volume up, and boom, there it is. So that's that's one of the little tricks I that we you know pretty much didn't find that out right away with some of our FM. <laughs> so it's and, a little trick. And for those of you that haven't had any experience with FM units yet, um, when you go to your audiologist and they give you a new map or a new program, um, they will tell you, okay, I've programmed it for the FM fifty fifty or sixty forty. Don, right. can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. Exactly, and what that's called is the mixing ratio. Now, this only has to do with implants. 
you don't really have to worry too much about this with hearing aids. So with implants, they set up a mixing ratio. And what that means is it's going to assign a value for what's coming from the FM and what's coming from the mics on your implant. So most of the time, we set it up 50-50. So even though you're plugged into this device and you're listening or you're listening through FM, 50% of your signal is coming from the FM and still 50% of your signal is coming into the mics of the implant. So the child's still going to be able to hear you. For the most part, that works well for most kids. Sometimes we need to skew that a little bit. Um, some kids, you know, need to pay attention to the FM signal a little bit more, so maybe we'll do two to one. So maybe, you know, twice as much information from the FM versus one part from the from the mics into the implant. So that's kind of what the mixing ratio is. I think the highest most of us would go would be uh-huh. three to one. Three to one on the mixing ratio. I, I don't know if anybody going any higher than that. Now, when you talk about an FM signal anyway, the other thing you have to understand is the FM signal is set up to come in 10 decibels higher than the signal coming from your hearing device. And this is kind of where you see that with the hearing aids, and you can actually you know, test it out in the test box that we have and see it working. Um, in the old system, so before 2008, it was fixed. That 10 dB was fixed, and it never changed which was great, at least the, the signal was 10 dB louder, but if the noise in the room got louder, then all of a sudden your FM advantage kind of disappeared, which is a bummer because you want that good 10 dB advantage, so you're getting a better signal from the FM. It's just a little bit louder than what's coming in on the mic. Now with what's called dynamic FM, which is um, a product of Phonak, what that means is you've got your 10 dB advantage of the FM over the hearing aid mics, and when the noise in the room starts to rise, that 10 dB advantage is maintained. So it's going to shift up as the room and the noise goes up, the 10 dB advantage goes up, and the whole thing just shifts up and down depending on what the noise is, what noise is going on in the room. So you maintain that good um, ratio of the FM over whatever's going on in the environment. So that's very important for most kids, and all their white papers and studies show that um, their subjects um, always would pick the dynamic FM over the traditional FM. So it definitely shows a lot of advantages for hearing impaired kids. Does that make sense? This is where I need that PowerPoint, see, to show. <laughs> um, Dr. Don, this is Sejo. I had a question, a very basic question. Um, once the child starts wearing or using FM frequently, um, will he not pay as much attention to when somebody is speaking to him without an FM? I mean, are, are, are we, um, I guess, spoon feeding him by giving him an FM? You know, I, I, you know, I, I would like to say yes, but I would also say no. I can see what you're saying is uh, here we're spoon feeding him an FM. It's a, it's a greater signal. It's a more precise signal. They're going to pay attention to it more. You know, I, I would like to answer that, but to be honest with you, there's no studies to show that once you take FM away, their speech perception is poor or degrades at all. If anything, I think for as far as speech understanding and speech perception and learning language, it actually is an advantage to them because they're not losing that language in the noise of the environment. So a lot of children, basically how they learn language is they overhear it. You know, we do directly teach them language when they're hearing impaired because they need that. But a lot of what they get playing with their friends and you know, listen to you guys talk around the house. It's, it's language learned by overhearing. It's incidental. So having that FM on there gives them that advantage, that incidental learning too. But, you know, to get back to answer your question, there's no studies that I can bring up in my head to say one way or the other as far as that goes. I, you know, we've um, used the FM quite a bit with my son, and I just, for what it's worth, I have not noticed that at all, that, um, you know, he doesn't pay less, he doesn't necessarily pay less, I mean, the FM, obviously he, um, you know, in, in the, in those settings where it needs, where it's needed, he pays better attention because he can hear better, but what I'm saying is when we're not using it around the house, it's not like he's ignoring me because I'm not, right. I don't have the FM out in the kitchen, you know, it's not like he, now he's just got to have the FM for every scenario, if that's what you meant, 
No, I haven't noticed that at all, and we've been using it for a few years. So, yeah. And and our kids at school, they leave BFM stays at school, and they go home. And and I haven't incidentally had any parents say, "Oh my gosh, since they got the FM, they don't listen to me at home anymore." So you know, anecdotally, I have not come across that either. But you know, I'm being 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 the way audiologists are, we always like to find a study that somebody's done, and and I don't know of any study that that is uh, even looked at that actually. Do many people use the FM at home? Um, you know, I, I don't think it's as used as, as much as it could be at home. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant thing to have at home, and my parents and families that have gotten them love it. And they say, so, you know, you hear things like, why didn't I get this, you know, four years ago? Um, all right, who's standing on the rail horse deck now? Um, <laughs> right next to the rail horse track. Um, I can think of, if I had it at home, I would use it in so many situations. It, you know, with it, if I had a kid that had hearing loss, I would use it everywhere. I would use it for the TV because we really don't know, especially the infant kids, what kids are hearing off the TV. And I can tell you, if you actually go back and question kids, they're probably under, hearing and understanding a lot less than you thought. A lot of times they're just watching the picture. So plugging the FM transmitter into the TV gives them direct access to that language. Not that I want them to learn language. I don't, but it does give them access to it. Um, using it for sports, you know, what, giving it to the coach so they can hear when things are, you know, when they're yelling stuff out. Uh, a lot of them will say, you know, well, my kid goes to karate. It's kind of lost on them sometimes because they can't hear what the instructor is saying. Um, using it for bike rides at the park. I mean, so you know, your kid, you don't have that fear that now they're 50 feet away, they can't hear me anymore, and I might be yelling for them to stop on their bike as they're approaching an intersection. You, you know, you say to them, stop. Believe me, they'll stop unless they don't want to stop. Then they won't stop. But um, they'll stop because they'll hear you 50, 75 feet away. So, but if it's at school, then it gets transported back and forth, or you buy another one. Most, you know, most school districts will not let you take them home. Yeah. Um, they will allow for the use in school on that set. So we do have families that, that um, do buy it for home themselves. And if you're lucky, you might have an insurance company that will buy it for you if you're lucky. Um, we do have a few as that has happened, so. And I have to share, and Don, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you do end up having to purchase one because your insurance won't cover, it is cheaper to purchase from a school than your audiologist, correct? Um, from but, your school audiologist in, instead of your... Actually, not in my case, that happens not to be the case. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I think it's probably case-by-case basis. Um, yeah, I would say case-by-case because yeah. it really depends on, one, where you are um, in the state, and then also it depends on who you're dealing with. Very often... Yes, you will have to pay a fitting fee if you see an audiologist. Uh, very often, though, like a school audiologist, like, you know, not like me in a private kind of, you know, not-for-profit school is different, but like a school audiologist in a public school is not going to be able to sell you an FM system. They, they either might, you know, might not have the capability to do that. So it really is more on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. How much does it cost? On average, on average, you know, for the equipment, you're looking at at least $3,000 for two receivers and a transmitter. Now, there are ways to make that less. You know you're going to need a transmitter, and a transmitter is going to be about $1,000. You have to have that part. You can, um, for older kids, not, not for the little kids, um, get a neck loop system, which means you really only need one receiver because it goes around their neck and then transmits to both devices if they have bilateral devices. So that kind of cuts the cost of the receivers in half. So that's always a possibility as well. But um, if you're looking for plug-in receivers for each device, then it's going to be at least about $3,000. And let's just clear up a little lingo. The transmitter is the piece that the person the speaking parent, would wear. Yep. Mm -hmm, and that's the receiver correct. would be going on the child, whether okay. that is being attached to their um, Implant, um, if they were like up behind the ear, um, or um, their hearing aids, or like you said, the neck. Right, the neck looks right. So I do want to say something, Don. 
when you brought up um, connecting to the TV, I never even thought of that. And how great for before when your child reads and, you know, closed captioning is just kind of words across the screen for them. Right. Um, but to have that extra input of the language through the FM. It, it is amazing. You know, I've kind of done an informal probe of the kids that I work with because a lot of times what I'll do is when I want to do stuff with their hearing aids um, or implants and I don't need their involvement right now to keep them occupied, I'll put a movie on. I'll let them pick out the movie. So it's one that they want to watch, one maybe they've seen before, and I'll let them watch it for a while. And afterwards I'll ask them questions about, like, well, who was that? What did they do? What was going on? And what is it, what did she say? Or even I'll just stop in the middle of, what did she just say? And a lot of times you'd be surprised how much they're not understanding. And so plugging the FM into the, the TV is just night and day. Um, all, all my families have said that. They've made that comment and they've had a transmitter at home that it's like night and day as far as what the kids are understanding off TV. And if they're yeah. kids that like to, so, like to watch, you know, Discovery Channel for kids, you know, I mean, that, that's a big piece, a learning piece for some of these older kids, too. You know, we, my son is six, and we started doing that um, a year or two ago, and I wish we had started when he was two, you know, when I first allowed him to watch those TBS shows or whatever. Yeah. I would have done it if, I had, if I had had one, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, I had, wouldn't have had one at that point. But anyway, the point being that um, it's great to plug it into the TV or even if they're on the computer when they get to that yep. point where they're starting to play little computer games on TBS.com or whatever. Um, exactly. You know, Don already explained that. I do have a quick question. Um, is the Y cord something that is in lieu of that, you know, that little, whatever you call it, that little cable connector that you've been talking about that can be plugged into the TV and the uh, uh, Um The Y cord for an implant or a hearing aid? Uh, I guess a hearing aid. I just don't, I'm not totally clear on is that an older technology, or do we still use that? Um, it, it is. An older, and a Y cord, what that does is just basically allows you to plug into a device that has a headphone jack. You still have to have, on the bottom of a hearing aid, you have to have audio shoes um, that, that the Y cord plugs into, because most Y cords are three-pronged plug-ins for the bottom of the boots for the hearing aids. And then the other end is a male jack, just like you have on your, your earphones for your iPod. And so it plugs into the headphone jack of something like an iPod or a DVD player or a CD player. And okay. so it, it, instead of having a wireless connection, it's giving you a wired connection. I see. And is that um, so that's in, sort of in lieu of an FM? And yes. is that signal not as good as the wireless signal well, with the FM? It, it's not stereo. So most of those cables are not stereo, so you're getting mono to each ear. But it works. It works pretty well. I mean, it's not bad, honestly. If you, have an FM, if you have an FM, there's really no reason to have one of those, right? Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah, but, you know, that's what we had before they kind of mastered this whole FM thing, and it works pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Now I'm dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have questions for Dawn? Um, I just have a question. Um, as far as with the phone act, Van, are there lots of different choices of kinds of FM systems, Van? This one does this, and this one does this, or is it pretty much, hey, here's our new thing out, and that's just the FM system from phone act now? Um, there are choices. So for the receivers that the child wears, that's going to be pretty limited based on the technology they have on their head. So if it's a hearing aid or an implant, that, that, that you're not going to have much choice in. It's going to be whatever works with your device. As far as the transmitter goes, there's a lot of choice. Um, there, there's ones that are more useful for school settings because they have um, things where we can set up, you know, multi-talker networks, so several transmitters and are talking, you know, on the same frequency and kids can listen to different people. What about personal um, FM systems? Are those quite a few choices? Yeah, there are, because, like, you know, for example, like, the SmartLink is their kind of, SmartLink Plus now is kind of like their top of the line, and it's a transmitter, but then it also is Bluetooth. So you can pair it with Bluetooth devices. So, for example, you can pair it with Bluetooth phone, and then you can have the phone calls transmitted wirelessly through the FM. You could pair it with um, a Bluetooth computer. So instead of plugging everything in, you just wirelessly 
um, talking to the computer and it's broadcasting out to the kid. And they compare with up to eight Bluetooth devices at once. So if your Bluetooth rigged all over your house, whew, you got it made. Um, so, but uh, and it has options like you can have um, a, a Omni mic, which means it's going to hear from all around it, and you can make that microphone more directed so it's more focused. So those are the big choices, um, like the smart link. From there, you're just kind of you're going down, so you're dropping features off. You know, well, how, so much, it, how much more is that one then? It's not that much more. Um, I think it's going to say like. Well, don't quote me on this ever because I think <laughs> I don't look at this every day. But if I remember correctly, I mean, it was like $150 more to get the Bluetooth, something like that. I mean, but it, that might not be exact. Um, you know, a lot of times the kids don't need the Bluetooth. But, you know, my kids that I'm dealing with are, you know, three, four, five, six. So, you know, they're not Bluetoothing anybody. You know, they don't have a Bluetooth phone. Well, maybe one of them does, but they don't have a Bluetooth phone. Um, so for the most part, using the, the cord to jack into those kind of things works pretty well, you know, for what you're using it for, the TV, a DVD player, um, a Nintendo thing. Um, it, it works pretty well. But now I guess you can do, like, Bluetooth Nintendo. What do I know? You know, so maybe you do want the Bluetooth off there. I don't know. So the, the, the FM um, that you get is specific for either hearing aids or code dealers because our, our son, we haven't yet decided the path yet because we're still, you know, we're at the very beginning of um, okay. figuring out what, you know, how, what hearing aids are doing right. for him and whether he's a candidate for code dealers. So um, is, is, that, is that specific to, you know, the type of hearing aid he has right now compared to, what kind of um, co-killers he might end up with yeah. or hearing it aids is. down the road he might even end up with. Exactly. It is, actually. Um, as far as hearing aids goes, for the most part, when you're ordering them for hearing aids, it's a universal receiver. So the part the child wears is universal. So it'll plug into any hearing aid. You just have to get the right connector, the right boot. As far as the implants, it is very specific, the implant. So... You might want to hold off until you kind of know where you, where you are. Um, now, if it's a baby, you, you know, you could always do, I mean, not on a baby. If they're older, you could always do the neck loop because the neck loop will talk to anything. A neck loop works off a T-coil, which is there on a hearing aid and it's there on an implant. So it'll work with anything. But I'm not a fan of putting a neck loop on a baby. In fact, I would say absolutely do not put a neck loop on a baby. Um, <laughs> So if he's a baby, I, I would probably hold off until you kind of stabilize and know where his hearing is going and what's going on, what you're doing with that. On that same note, um, I know that my um, our therapist who had kind of discussed FMs with me um, ha had mentioned that children who um, is where uh, the doctor, where we, mm -hmm. uh, our son goes to, they used to loan out FMs. Um, and I guess now they, they don't do that as much because they have a lot more families. And I'm wondering if you know of any place that maybe does still loan out FMs. Um, I, that, I don't. You know, I, wish, I wish I did, but I don't. Um, there's no program like that through any of the manufacturers. Um, and I was going to say if anybody did, it would probably be children's, but it sounds like they're not doing it anymore, too. Yes, I do not. I wish I did. Now, John, I have a question for you. Um, going back to the question with the, um, does it make a difference what type of equipment they use? Is it just the receiver part that would change? So if they had the transmitter, yes. they would just have to buy new receivers if they switch yes. from a hearing aid to an image. Exactly. So it's not the whole cost that they have yes. to redo. Just the receivers. Okay. Exactly. Unless you have the necklace, then that'll talk to anything. But other than that, yes, it, you do it just, just have to change the receivers, not the transmitter that the speaker wears. Any other questions? Don, this is Pauline. Um, with the FM system, I know that people said they use it in churches or like our um, schools have had a variety show and people were using different mics. So do all of those sound systems have one place to plug in the FM system? Yeah, usually you're going to plug in, you're going to take your transmitter and you're going to take that little jack cord that we talked about and you're going to plug it into audio out on a TV um, or audio out on a device. 
um, unless you don't want to hear what the kid is listening to. So, for example, if they're watching a movie on a DVD player and you don't want to listen to it, then you plug them into the headphone jack and then you don't have to hear it. But for the most part, it's audio out. Okay. Or auxiliary out, but that's where usually you're plugging it into. And that way, the person speaking doesn't have to wear, like, you know, 15 transmitters. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So, Don, I have a question. If you plug into the TV, you said that the device had to be all the way up as far as volume. You, you don't do that on the TV. No, not on the TV. No, no. No, not on the TV. <laughs> that would not be a pleasant family. Do not do that on the TV. <laughs> just just on, on an iPhone or an iPod or a Nintendo DS or something like that. Something where it would be more of, of a hearing child using headphones. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, on the TV, it's important if you're going to use it on the TV. Like I just said, if you want everybody to hear what's going on on TV, then you've got to find that audio output jack. If you don't want to hear what's going on on the TV, then you just plug it into the headphone jack, and then they only hear it. TV goes off, and then then you don't hear anything. So, Are there any good um, websites or any anything that you can recommend as far as if, Families already have an FM system, um, maybe troubleshooting it. Yeah. Um, or yeah, F- Phonak has a really great FM. If you get into their FM site, or even their what's called their school desk, they have troubleshooting on there for each each transmitter that you have. Um, you can go into like their what's called the configurator. So what you do is you put in the hearing device the child has, whether it's you know, implant or hearing aid, the very specific, you know, one. And then you choose what devices as far as FM you have, as far as the receivers and the transmitter. And you can print out, like, a how-to-do-it kind of book, which is kind of cool. Um, so I would definitely go on to Phonak and look up, um, go in through, um, you know, patients or users and, and just look up their explanation of FM. They have some pretty cool videos on there that kind of explain how FM works, and and then you can go um, take the leap into, you know, troubleshooting as well. And that's phonak.com? Yep, phonak.com. And phonak being spelled P-H-O-N-A-K. You got it. And then if you, if you really want to be a nerd like me, you can go into their school desk, and I think that's e-school desk. Dot com, eSchoolDesk.com, and that has that configurator on there, and it has a lot more inf- inf- you know, specific information about each transmitter and each receiver. But, you know, usually that's for nerds like me, so. Um, I was just going to mention to you, Don, I don't know if you just mentioned it, but on the Phonak website, they have a great FM simulator. So you they can do. Listen. Yeah. You can listen exactly. to a classroom, you know, it's a yeah. simulation of a child listening to their classroom without an FM on, and then you click and you can listen to... Um, you can listen to traditional FM, and then I think you can listen to dynamic FM. Dynamic, yeah. And so That's it's just a really great way to sort of, you know, get inside your child's head and see what it's like. So. Exactly, yeah. They have other, they have some really cool videos on their website, I have to say. Yep. I have a question. Yeah. Um. And what kind of settings or in schools, like in total communication or in or schools, where would be more used the FM? Where would we use? Well, I would say, you know, it should be used in both regardless. I mean, total okay. communication implies that you're signing in speaking, so they still need right. access to that, that voice. Um, um, so I would say it should be used in both in an ideal world. <laughs> How's that? How's that? Okay. Stepping off the box. And I, I have to share, um, Jack uses an FM at his school, and a uh, funny story, they had a um, story reader come in, and the story reader was deaf, and so he was signing the story, so they had somebody voicing the story for him, and that person was wearing the FM. And halfway through the story, Jack taps his teacher, and he's like, why do I hear a girl in my ear? <laughs> because the person <laughs> voicing was a girl, and the person – that was uh, reading, uh, you know, um, the story was a man, and he didn't quite get <laughs> where this woman's voice was coming from. Aww. <laughs> That's so cute. Right. Well, our kids, our kids love it. I have to say, you know, um, you know, most of the time I'm starting them in the FM at four. Hi. At four. 
Hi. Um, so most of the time we're kind of coming around four, um, sometimes three and a half depending on the kid. And, and they, I know at our school it's become like a fat symbol now. You know, when I started there three years ago, I think we had, and Carrie, you can attest this, probably two kids with FM, maybe. And and that was one of my big things when I came in there. It's like, what, why don't you guys have FM? And we thought, well, well, we have these small groups and these small classrooms. I don't think we really need it. And I did kind of get some resistance from the teachers about, you know, pushing forward and getting FM to the kids. But now pretty much everybody in our upper class, the P2 class, I have one one child who doesn't have FM, and that's already in the works. He's, it's coming, um, and he's the last one. And the teachers, the teachers will tell you that even in the small groups, it's made such a difference as far as the kids' attention, um, articulation. It, it, they really feel like they see the benefit of it now. And now, especially in like Jeanette's class, which is the larger group, um, where it could be up to you know 15 to 20 kids in that room at one time. She, they all really have just bought into the FM feature that, that this is something these kids need regardless of the size of the room, regardless of the acoustics of the room. And our acoustics are pretty good, um, that, that they really feel that this, this is a benefit to all our kids. And like I said, the kids are all now, if they don't have one, they're like, when am I getting my boots? That's like they always kept stop me in the hall. When are my boots coming? And that's like it. They all want FM now. I want to hear the beat. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of cool. And again, the boots. Uh, or what those receivers are called the that receivers, are the, right. the hearing aid or the implants. Yeah, the kids call them boots. It's just easier to say than receivers. So. <laughs> and they do kind of look like little boots because they hang yeah. off the bottom side. Yeah, they so, do. Like a little shoe, I guess. Yep, exactly. So, well, very good. Any other questions for Don before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, I do have one uh, question. Um, sure. How would how would it uh, be different because I know you were talking about um, implants and hearing aids. So what would you say about Baja? Um, Baja. As far as I know, Baja, you are able to boot in a universal receiver reaching back. I don't have any kids with Baja right now, and I haven't had one in a few years. But my understanding is um, you can plug in a universal MLXS receiver to it. And, and it works pretty well. I mean, those kids that get the Baja when it's right, they, they rock out with it, from my experience. Um, and so just plugging the FM into that should uh, be an additional benefit for them as well. Will you also recommend doing, the, like, uh, if there's a chance to do the Bluetooth, do you know of any, if that's even possible with the Baja too, or is that, is that possible? Sure, it doesn't matter because once the signal gets to the child, mm -hmm. they, they don't know where it came from. So it could have come from a Bluetooth, it could have come from a DVD, it could have come from you speaking. So they're they're still going to get the same signal once it's at that receiver on their head. Okay. Yeah. I have one other question. Is yes. I have, my little girl is three and a half. She's very petite, and we're just now getting to where she can wear. She has A B, and so we're yes. just now getting to where she can wear it behind her ear. Yeah. So if we add an FM system boot on there, do you have any um, advice or input as far as a way to keep it? Do they Are they using um, the toupee tape or what? Honestly, I have a couple of kids that are very tiny in stature, and, and the best way I've seen, and boy, let me tell you, parents are so imaginative. <laughs> the best way I've seen it hold everything on, because once those ABs are bigger, and then you add the eye connect which is a different type of ear hooks that the boot plugs into. It really, using those stretchy headbands and, and not necessarily like smushing the device next to their head even, but more just kind of hooking the device through the, the, the I don't know if you've seen them, but they're like, um, I don't know what they're called, but they're kind of like a mesh headband, so it's not solid. It's got holes in it. It's kind of mesh and it's really stretchy. It's like the crocheted ones? Yeah, or? but okay. like they're headbands. Those, those things work great. For our kids, and not, I mean, it's not that, sometimes it's not the size. Sometimes the kids have mis misshapen heads. Sometimes they have low set ears that are small or maybe not formed well. So there can be many reasons why it doesn't stay on their, their ears very well. And and using those headbands, if you can't keep it on the ear, what you can do then is you can just kind of hook it through the headband. And that seems to work pretty well. 
So, and it doesn't interfere or, you know, cause problems with noise, rubbing on it or anything like that. I mean, those, those work pretty good. I have one cat, I'll tell you, her implants are dangling all the time. I mean, and she's eight, and they're always dangling, and no matter, I try to pay pay, she won't wear the headband. I mean, it's just, you know, it's kind of like my battle every day is to get these things to stick on her ears. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. Um, and so, you know, I've definitely been there. <laughs> And then the and then the teacher's like, why are they always dangling? I'm like, well, if you come up with anything that solves that besides the sexy headband, let me know. Um, but yeah, that seems those seem to work the best. Do you have very many that use the ear molds? We do, um, but if the kids' ears are not, you know, large enough to hold the device, um, then the ear molds are really not going to help with that. That's what we're having. Okay. Yeah. For a kid who has normal size ears, normal shaped ears, the ear molds work right. So. But she has normal shaped ears, just the age She's just tiny. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. She's just tiny. And so, you know, the problem is the device that you're trying to hook on her ear is much bigger than her ear. Yeah. And her ear's like, I don't think so. There's just not enough room back here. <laughs> right. And so that that's where it's just taking it, you know, a couple of inches behind and hooking it through the headband, you know, kind of helps. Take the weight off there. Good advice. Yeah, give it a try. Excellent. Well, I want to thank everyone for being on the call, and um, we did some great sharing tonight. I do have those um, save the date kind of things that are coming up um, written in a document, a Word doc. Um, so I will send that out by email tomorrow. Uh, for everyone that was on the call, if they'd like some of the some of the web links, and um, John, would you mind emailing me the phone app link and then that eSchool desk sure. link, uh, sure. and then I'll add that to the email as well. And um, also, then you'll also have John's email information. Yep. If you haven't met her and don't know her, and you have any other questions, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer. Absolutely. <laughs> I just kind of. Put that you put you under the bus there. Sorry, <laughs> but I know you. You would be happy to answer. I would, and, and I want to thank everybody for staying on with me. I apologize again um, for coming in late, but yeah, you know, thanks for staying with me and and uh, being here till the end. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.